Today, we welcome Dr. Nina Hall to speak with us. Nina is an assistant professor of international relations at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Europe. And her work focuses on issues of transnational advocacy and international organizations in international relations. Today, she joins us to discuss her latest book, Transnational Advocacy in the Digital Era, Think Global, Act Local. Following her talk, we'll take a few questions via the Q&A function. So please feel free to submit questions and let us know who you are when you submit. If you want to dive deeper, the link to purchase her book is on our event page. I'm looking forward to hearing more about how digital instruments and connectivity are changing advocacy. So Nina, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. And thank you all for joining and the Wilson Center for hosting. It's a wonderful opportunity to speak with you. I understand there's people on uh, this Zoom talk from all around the world, and I, I hope we get a, a diverse set of questions. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So patience for one second. All right, we can all see that. Great. So I want to speak to you about a book that I actually wrote and came out over just over a year ago now called Transnational Advocacy in the Digital Era. Now, this book uh, was written not just to talk about the impact of social media, and it was, I should note, free chat GPT, but it makes a questions how are activists and advocacy organizations changing in the digital era? And I want to just give you a bit of a taste of the kinds of organizations I'm interested in studying. Because when we think about the digital era, we tend to focus on the platforms and not on the people and organizations that use them to mobilize people offline as much as online. And this is a key part of the book. It's asking questions about how digital technologies enable activists to shape public debate through mobilizing people offline as well as on. So to give you a flavor of the kinds of organizations and cases I use, there's an organization in Germany, which some of you may be familiar with, called Campact, which is, was very active in 2014 and 15 against uh, the EU, US trade agreement, TTIP, and the EU-Canada trade agreement. Here you can see an image um, on the left of one of their, their founders um, who is giving a talk at the, con and the context is uh, there were thousands of people, almost quarter of a million mobilized on the streets of Berlin to protest against TTIP and CETA. Of course, I should note that the pol politics of this changed a lot when Trump was elected. But one of the interesting things to note is that Germany had larger mobilizations than many other European countries, even though some political economists would argue stood the most to benefit. And in my work, I argue that Campact was one of the organizations that played a pivotal role in mobilizing people against these trade agreements. We look to Australia, very different issue, refugees, um, but a similar time, an organization called Get Up which is a sister organization of CAMPAC, also mobilizing people on the streets to welcome more refugees. And they were using digital technologies, and I'll, I'll get to how they did it. Meanwhile, in Poland, a group called Aksja Demokracja mobilized people onto the streets, also using a range of social media and email to protest against um, the lowering of the judge's retirement age, which was seen as an interference of the government the judiciary. Now, what's interesting here, for those of you who have never heard of these organizations before, that's fine, is that all of these organizations are part of a family, which I call in the book, digital advocacy organizations. And the first example of a digital advocacy organization is Move On. Move On was founded in the US in 1998, and in fact, has been well written about by a colleague, uh, David Karp from DGW, wrote the book, The Move On Effect. And in the Move On effect, he argued that Move On had a, made an um, unexpected transformation of American political advocacy. Why? Because they were a very different type of political organization. They lowered the bar for membership, which meant that you no longer had to write, sign up, pay membership dues. You could become a member simply by signing an email and acting online on a regular basis. This could be sharing on social media, or signing subsequent petitions and sharing them. But what's important here is that not only did they use the internet to communicate with their members, but they 
held on to those members for subsequent campaigns, from a campaign, say, the Iraq War, to campaigning later about climate. It was a multi-issue organization. In Karp's subsequent work, he also outlined how Move On and other organizations do what he calls analytic activism. They don't just use social media or email to blast emails and to communicate, they also test their communications. They figure out what issues their members are most interested in. So they could send one half of this audience an email about climate change saying we should save the climate to save the polar bears and another half we should save the climate to save the penguins and see which wins and then send that out to the full list. Now I'm going into this in some depth because, and I'll talk further about it, but what's important to note here is that Move On in many ways wasn't the first in the US, but pioneered a number of these practices. And these practices have been emulated by organizations all around the world. Activists in Australia, in the UK, in Germany, in Israel, Romania, South Africa, Poland, New Zealand, and many more have seen this distinctive model of organizing, of mobilizing, and have sought to set up their own independent organizations. And what I found when I started this research was that while there's quite a lot known about individual organizations in their own national context, move on in the US, get up in Australia, 38 degrees in the UK, no one had drawn the dots to connect how these organizations relate to each other and the ways that they campaign collectively. And this is important because um, my own uh, discipline is in international relations. And so the, the sort of value add I can bring as a scholar is understanding the transnational connections. Because really what I'm describing here is a global phenomenon. We can see digital advocacy organizations operating. This is six continents, 19 countries. And I should say this is slightly dated material now. There's actually even more countries where they're active, including in Brazil, um, a group called NOSAS. Um, and there are new initiatives being uh, started. A number you'll see are clustered in Europe, also in, in South Africa. And they claim 20 million member supporters. And you, we can talk more about who those members are in the demographics because it's not what you think. They're not all young people. It's actually more baby boomers, um, middle-class, educated, but actually an older generation, not the young millennials. I should note, however, that these organizations while they're all independent, have formed a network, which I will talk about. And that network has sought to spread this model quite proactively in some cases, but their attempts haven't always worked. So while there've been attempts to replicate and emulate this model in places like Italy, where I'm based right now, talking to you from Bologna, Nepal, Indonesia, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Spain, and France, they haven't always taken root. And we can talk about that in the Q&A. I'd also note that there are no cases in authoritarian regimes, and that will probably become apparent why throughout the question and answer. So in my research, I'm interested in this model. I'm not asking the bigger question of how is all advocacy changing, but what is distinctive about this model of organization? What are the strengths and weaknesses if this is a distinctive model of this approach? And the theoretical question I ask for the academics in the Zoom room is how do these organizations challenge conventional IR theories of advocacy? And I'm going to argue they do, and I'm going to play, uh, sort of explain why that is. The second question is a more empirical question, which is how do digital advocacy organizations campaign transnationally? I'm going to speak mostly to this first question in our presentation today, but I will come to some of the findings in a second. Now, before I delve too much into the findings, I just do want to set a bit of the, the sort of broader context about the academic debate here. And I want to mention one thing. The elephant in the room, often when we think of social media, is that any activism to do with social media is just clicktivism. It's just easy. You can easily click, um, sign a petition. And this is the critique by Gladwell. It's all weak ties. And in fact, a lot of the early literature saw this in some ways as a benefit. You don't really need formal political organizations anymore. Any of us can go just go start a petition. You don't need organizational leadership or structures, but this can also be a weakness, as Tefeci has argued, because movements that just use social media that don't have hierarchies struggle to learn, struggle to coordinate and negotiate. Now, my work fits with the sort of response to this literature, and it says that 
formal political organizations are still important, even in the digital era, maybe even more so, right? So we need organizational hierarchies for effective activism. And some of the work by other scholars, and uh, I'm happy to elaborate more on this, like Jen Schrady, have, have shown this, have shown that hierarchy is important in delegating tasks. And another important point I think to make is that there's often an overly facile distinction between online activism and offline as if these two worlds are very distinct. In fact, we know that there's a lot of uh, interrelationship between them. So what did I do in my research? Uh, I spent over five years doing some quite deep ethnographic work, participant observation, sitting in on the summit of this network of digital advocacy organizations. This network is called OPEN, the Online Progressive Engagement Network. Um, they've actually just celebrated their 10 year anniversary. They've been around since 20, uh, 2013. And it brings together all of these independent organizations. They choose to be part of this network. So Canadian group, New Zealand group, German, US group, move on. And I conducted over 100 interviews, often with the people who founded digital advocacy organizations. And I set, um, collected a set of campaign actions, which I'll present towards the end. Now, one of the core findings of the book is that these digital advocacy organizations, which I argue are, are distinct from other NGOs like Green Pieces of the World, Oxfam, Human Rights Watch, they pose four challenges to how we conceptualize advocacy, at least in international relations and perhaps also in other disciplines. And this relates to how they operate. So I wanna speak through these four challenges today. The first interesting thing I noticed when I started studying these organizations was that unlike many NGOs, groups like GetUp, that's the Australian sister organization to move on, engage in election campaigning. And not just for a specific issue, they engage in campaigning for candidates. They're all progressive organizations, I should say. So they push progressive candidates and try to, uh, oust or unseat conservative candidates. And they do this using pretty conventional tools and politics. You can see up on the left, a photo of GetUp's volunteers, some of their members going out, door knocking, canvassing, um, putting up billboards. And in some occasions, they have had real impact. So GetUp in Australia was one of the key players in getting um, Tony Abbott to lose his electorate seat in Warringah in central Sydney. And he actually acknowledged that himself. Now, why this is important for scholars of international relations and NGOs is that most NGOs, when we think about them, don't explicitly engage in, in camp political campaigning. They wait until after the electoral season to then try and influence whoever's elected, or they might push a particular issue, but because they're charities, they cannot, because of their legal status, engage in such partisan activities. And these organizations can. The second element that's interesting, and this is probably the most obvious for many of us on the internet, is that these groups are rapid response. They can start a campaign from one day to the next. They don't have the sort of long-term necessary commitment to a cause that we associate with like, you know, the work of Amnesty International Human Rights or Greenpeace and Climate, sustain it for years and years on end. And that's partly because these organizations are multi-issue generalists. They see their role as catching an issue when it's at a tipping point. Maybe there's coming up a big debate within the parliament or a referendum on something or a big summit, an international summit. And that's when they try and push the change. This is different from what I argue most NGOs who have at least some degree of expertise on the issue they campaign on, right? Human Rights Watch, does a lot of investigations of human rights abuses and writes a lot of reports, Transparency International on Corruption, Oxfam on Development and Poverty Issues. They often publish reports that they spend a year or more preparing. Now, this is in many ways because digital advocacy organizations have this model precisely because they're member driven. So 38 Degrees, for instance, has in the past had a Monday meeting and gone, here are the top 10 issues that our members care about and that's what we'll campaign on. 
They're also predominantly member funded. Over 90% of their funds come from members, not from grants um, or from foundations. And that's different, I argue, from NGOs where an expert staff at Human Rights Watch might sit down and say, we think that right now the most important pressing human rights issue is what's happening in Ukraine or what's happening in Ethiopia or what's happening in, in Burma. And we look to those organizations often to provide that kind of guidance. It would be problematic if Human Rights Watch sent out a survey to its members and said, what do you think is the most important human rights issue? So I want you to see that these are analytical differences. And so far, I'm not making a normative assessment about one model being better than the other. I'm just trying to spell out these distinctions. In the book, I then set out how these organizations can use this model to create digitally networked power. Importantly, I'm not arguing they always do this. They're definitely not always successful, but there are occasions where they can be rapid response, listen to their members' interests, and then set up campaigns on issues they weren't campaigning on previously. 38 Degrees did this during the refugee crisis, quickly scaled up a campaign, demanding that the British government extend a welcome to more refugees. And as part of a broader movement, um, they got the Prime Minister David Cameron to agree to put welcome more refugees. But in the book, I also pause and say, well, what are the limits of this model? Because while 38 Degrees was very fast and pivoted and, you know, got thousands of people to sign campaigns to welcome refugees, they were also fast to drop that campaign to welcome refugees and to focus on saving the bees. Now, there were good reasons for this. Many of their members care deeply about saving the bees. And there was also financial reason to do so. Saving the bees brought in more money over a significant period of time than saving refugees. And so in the book, I test out and look at some of the limitations of if you're always rapid response, you're always reacting to your members' interests as they're revealed from week to week. It means that you don't do the sustained long-term campaigning. Other NGOs may do it. We can talk about how they collaborate with other NGOs in the Q&A. And what was interesting for me is that I didn't just study one organization or one case. I spent five years with the organizations and they themselves became aware of this limitation that if they're so member driven, they become rapid and reactive to their preferences. It's easy to run popular campaigns, but harder to run campaigns for minority rights. In contrast, 38 degrees, rapid response for refugees and then switching to the bees. We have the example of in Australia, this organization Get Up, so the sister organization of, of Move On, mobilized many people on the streets to welcome refugees at the same time in 20, uh, late 2015. But they then ran a campaign, which you can see a photo of at the bottom, called Let Them Stay, which was also about welcoming refugees and asylum seekers onto the Australian mainland. What's important here is that they ran it, even though it wasn't necessarily driven by a huge member demand, because staff saw the need to continue to campaign on refugee rights, and they had long-term strategic goals about this. And there are other examples in the book, which I touch on, Action Station New Zealand, making Māori rights a real priority for the organization and finding campaigns to run rather than just being purely driven by members and trying to actually shift and change their members' preferences. Now, this is a more complicated story, which I'm happy to unpack in Q&A, to what extent can they shift their members' preferences. But I want you to get a sense that while I've got this one form of being rapid and reactive and fast moving, which has some benefits, it also has some limits. And the organizations themselves are evolving um, to, to deal with that. Now, in the last um, few minutes of my presentation, I just want to stand back. So far, I've described an organizational model the move on, if you like, model that is spread around the world, it's spread from the US to Poland, to South Africa, to New Zealand, Australia, Germany. And I've told you what makes it distinctive from other NGOs, this member-driven multi-issue rapid response campaign that's operating during election as well. Now I wanna stand back and think about, well, how do these groups campaign transnationally? And the book does quite a lot of work looking at the different dimensions, the way that they share tactics, the way they share tech, the way they meet up regularly to learn best practices. And one of the questions I specifically asked though in the book is, 
Do they campaign transnationally on the same issue at the same time? Now, the relevance of this is that often people in the late 90s thought the internet will mean that borders will disappear, right? It doesn't, it's not really relevant anymore where you're from. You can share a campaign anywhere. And we can see that it's even being sped up with social media, memes, Black Lives Matter, for instance, you know, or Me Too movement or the youth climate strikes could spread very quickly, virally online. So the question I try to get at here is, well, do we see a lot of transnational campaigns? And I look at that by asking, are the groups I study campaigning on a transnational issue? And who is the target? Who, is, who are the decision makers they're trying to influence? So I collected um, over a year, all of the campaign actions of four of the organizations, Australia and New Zealand and the UK and Germany to get a geographic spread. Um, and then me and a research assistant looked at whether or not these campaigns related to a domestic issue, which is significant for proportion, just over half did, could be changing, uh, say, the NHS, the National Health Service in the, uh, the UK. Or Brexit, of course, was a little bit of a complicated category in between. And what proportion related to a transnational issue? And what we found is that 40, roughly 40%, almost half, if you count Brexit, of their campaigns had some relationship to a transnational issue. This could be climate change, or it could be something like here, this example of, of Campact, the German organization's campaign to stop the Mercosur trade agreement and to save the Amazon. So just remember that we've got 40% are related to a transnational issue. Now look at this graph. You'll see it's almost entirely red. It's almost entirely the campaigns are being run focused on a domestic sector. This could be a national minister, a prime minister, a president, or even a more local level uh, after a city council. And only 2% or three out of the total 150 campaign actions we looked at related to an international target. And why is this interesting? It's interesting because a lot of the literature in international relations has suggested that as more and more issues get moved to the international level and international organizations like the EU have more authority, we'd expect contestation to shift, right? Also, many of us might recall back to the protests at Seattle, big climate marches outside the UNFCCC, the, the politicization of the WTO, and think one would expect some contestation at that level. However, what we see here is exactly the opposite, that even though these organizations, digital advocacy organizations, can easily collaborate, they can share tactics and tech, and they have a common set of progressive values, so a common set of campaign issues, they have common positions on climate, trade, um, and refugee rights, for instance, they target national decision makers on these international issues. So when they're campaigning on climate, they target the climate minister or the equivalent uh, minister. And that's because their theory of change, the way they see their influence in the world is to mobilize citizens to put pressure on national decision makers. These organizations, when I interviewed them and I, I shared this, um, the, these findings and ran focus groups, um, and it was very evident that they all saw the nation state as the locus of power. In fact, the very decision to set up national organizations, get up is based in Australia, Campact in Germany is part of the model. There are some organizations I should mention that are international, like Avaz, and that actually just falls on the, on the border of, of my research. Um, and we can get into that more in Q&A. But the, the thinking behind this model was very much influenced by Ben Branzell, who was one of the, he was the founding director of the network and was pivotal in helping to spread this model internationally. And he saw it as optimizing power for domestic influence, but network for global scale. Now, there's two interesting points to make here. Why is this important? Firstly, it's important because when we think about globalization, when we think about digital politics, we often assume, or it can be easy to make uh, quick assumptions that national politics is no longer so important. And my work is suggesting exactly the opposite. We need to keep looking at the role of nation states. A second important element to this is that this is why these groups are also involved in election campaigns. 
right? So when they're, they're holding domestic uh, decision makers to account at the most important moment when elections are on, and it's difficult for them to run in authoritarian regimes because of the kind of advocacy that they're doing. So in conclusion, my book is really a deep ethnography about digital advocacy organizations. And I do talk about how they collaborate with other NGOs like Greenpeace or, or um, human rights organizations. And what I'm arguing is that in, even in the digital era, as political scientists, international relations scholars, we need to be looking at understanding the decisions that these organizations are, made, are making, not just looking at their online you know, profile and their web links and their Twitter feeds. We need to actually understand and talk to the people who are making organizations about what they do online. Because once we do, we start to see that their models are really interesting and actually quite distinct from other NGOs, that they're member-driven rapid response, they're multi-issue. And that's quite distinct from how most other NGOs operate. And that their power comes from mobilizing people, mobilizing citizens often on the streets, not necessarily just in tweets online. So they do both. And that they focus on national decision makers, even though 40% of uh, their campaigns target transnational issues. They have millions of members. And in the book, I argue that they can influence and shape public debate and have done on some issues like climate in some cases, trade, for instance, in the German case, refugees in the Australian case. And so I want to leave you with this last image of, of, of the People's Climate March, which was organized in 2014, as one example of how even though you can be focused on a national decision maker, you can still be part of a global movement. This march was organized by 350.org and supported by a number of the organizations in my study who held national days of action on climate change. Um, to try and mobilize people to put pressure on their national decision makers, but it was on the same issue across the globe. So there was a sense of a global action, but nationally targeted. And I think this form of what's sometimes called digitally distributed protest is extremely interesting and powerful um, and worthy of, of further discussion uh, today. So I'll leave it at that and open to any and all questions. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you so much, Nina. That was such a fascinating look at how digital communications, digital networks are trickling out into real action and impact in, in the, the physical world. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge, it looks like a few people may have had trouble seeing part of the talk. So I do encourage you to return to this page and see a recording later if you weren't able to catch the beginning. Um, but, um, and I also encourage you to submit questions if you've got any for Nina right now. But uh, in the meantime, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, first and foremost, what comes next in your research? Great, thanks, Kelly. Yeah, so I have a project I'm working on about whether or not technology is helping or hindering climate activists. And as I just noted, I think there's real potential. Groups like Fridays for Future Youth Climate Strikers have used technology, obviously, to, to magnify their cause. But it's also interesting that in the early days of their protest, most of their communications and most of the people they recruited was face-to-face. -face. So other researchers have found going out into the streets that they recruit a lot of people um, to the new climate strikes. So I think there's a real interesting question to ask about how much technology helps and how much it also hinders, given that technology can also be used to surveil climate activists, can also be used to, you know, in all sorts of, of different ways. And I have a second project, which is really about the legal form of NGOs and their funding model. And there's, I think, as I noted here, a huge emphasis on NGOs as not-for-profits and as charities, which are limited in terms of what they can do in terms of partisan politics. But actually, NGOs have agency and can choose different organizational or legal status. And I'm really interested in the implications of that. So they're two big projects I'm working on now. That's so interesting. And you know, you, you referenced the kind of technology, both helping climate activism and hindering it, um, that I feel like it's always a part of our work in science and technology policy is, is this double-edged sword. There's the authoritarian uses of technology look the same as the democratic uses. And you really, it's hard to control one without limiting both, you know? Um, so I look forward to seeing what comes out of your work there. Um, a couple of other questions that I just really thought were, uh, would love to pursue more. Um, on one of your slides, you talked about just the number of 
these movements that exist and the number of countries that they have emerged in. Um, but you had at the bottom of that slide a list of some countries where they've failed, and this may be out of the scope of your research, so the, you know, feel free to, we can pivot to another question, but can you talk at all about what led some of these attempts to fail? Was it a limitation on technology or access to the internet? Was it leadership? Um, what, what determines the winners and the losers uh, for these organizers? Sure, I'm very happy to speak to that. Um, one of the fascinating things for me is that I met organizations at different stages of their development. So I did meet some cases of organizations that launched and then subsequently died off. So there's different types of failures, some that never got to the launch phase and some that thought about emulating and then never actually emulated. So the first thing to note is that failure is a really broad category here of across from really getting quite far to setting up or even setting up an organization. And the reasons that they didn't take off or they didn't continue to survive are varied. I'll give you a couple of cases. Um, in Italy, where I'm based, there was an organization, Progressi, that was set up and campaigned on refugee rights for a few years. It was set up by a, a journalist. Um, but one of the reasons he said was so difficult to survive was that there was other organizations that they were in competition with, namely the Five Star Movement. And if you're familiar with Italian politics, the Five Star Movement is a broadly sort of left center left coalition of uh, or political party that uses digital technology to create its political platform. And so in a way, the Five Star Movement was a new kind of political organization and it had a massive appeal. And so people that might have otherwise gone into a non-political party type organization were being attracted and putting their activity there. Another example of failure, which I think tells a different story, is a group in Colombia that almost got off the ground bullet. So one of their activists, and I, I quote her in the book, did come along to a number of these meetings and I met her and she was really interested. She'd worked at a vase and she wanted to replicate the model. But it was very difficult for her because she was on her own in Colombia and there weren't other organizations around in Latin America at the time. And one of the interesting things there is that a lot of the groups that have succeeded have been in Europe. So they can learn from each other. They're on the same time zone. They can share ideas. They can share ways of getting like fundraising strategies, ways of getting members. And sitting up on your own in Latin America, there were also security concerns, being an activist in Colombia made it much more difficult for her. So I think there's a, also a population effect of having others uh, nearby. Another thing to point out that's obvious, and this will be the last one, is that um, getting member funding is critical for survival. In some countries, the philanthropic culture isn't strong enough to get high member funding. And in South Africa, Amandla Mobi has adapted. It has a large support base from Black South African women who are in lower socioeconomic areas, but it gets some funding from grantees to supplement it. So I think there's a number of factors. It's not just about internet accessibility or the digital divide. It's also about you know, where is the funding going to come from? Do you have other organizations around that you can learn from? And what other competition is out there in terms of that organization space? Kind of staying on this topic of, um, you know, what can really drive success for these organizations. I, I read a little bit of your book already and I look forward to finishing it. Um, but you talk about the open network or the, the which is, appears to be a, a kind of a, a gathering and a coalition of a lot of different advocacy organizations. Uh, and you mentioned this in your presentation, where they can share knowledge, issues, tech tips. Um, how much does, I guess, I guess I have two questions. One, is is that membership, is that network selective? Are there advocacy organizations that don't get to be a part of that? And two, how much of a role does that network play in the ultimate success of an advocacy uh, network? Great, so open is selective. Despite its name, it's not completely open. Um, it allows one organization per country. And this is an interesting point because Move On has created other spin-offs. Um, it's a color of change, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, we also have Some of Us, which is international but based in the US that campaigns for against, or focuses its campaigns on businesses. But Some of Us and Avaz and Color of Change are not part of open. We Move, which is a regional organization in Europe that was partly spurred on by Campact, the German organization. 
is also not part of OPEC. Uh, 350.org, which is just focused on climate, All Out, which is digital campaigning on gay rights, also not part of Open. And they form like the sort of outside, I guess, like next layer beyond the cases I focus on. And the reason that they were selective in setting up who could be part of this network was very explicit. The founders of Open wanted there to be no competition in the network for membership or funding. They were concerned that if you had multiple overlapping constituencies, that groups would be reluctant to share their biggest failures or their biggest successes. And the network has high trust and it's, an, it's been amazing to follow how much gets exchanged across the network because they're not competing largely for resources. Um, so on your second question about to what extent is open as a network fundamental for the success, I think it's been really fundamental, not necessarily for individual campaigns, but in the growth of organizations. And what was fascinating is I did interviews with groups that were established before the network was founded in 2013. So in Canada, in the US, in Germany, Australia, the UK, all the groups were founded before the network. Then they established a network and subsequent groups, often the founders talk about how important and pivotal it was to be part of a network that they could learn from. So Polish activists, for instance, um, learned from this network and it was hard for them to explain what a model of digital campaigning and member driven would look like without having access to it. In New Zealand, the head of Action Station New Zealand went to Australia and spent time in the Australian one learning how it worked. In Ireland, the Irish one went the director and learned from 38 degrees directly. So they actually had what they called secondments. So I think what was really interesting is not just about individual campaigns, but actually understanding how an organizational model can diffuse through a very dense network. That's so interesting. Um, and I do want to remind everyone, please feel free to submit a question on the event page. You can just uh, type something in and shoot it over to us. Um, one of the things you mentioned um, about trust, actually, when I was reading um, some of what you wrote down about how did you do the research for this book, and it looked like you had incredible access to people for interviews, to receive data for quantitative analysis about how they're working. Um, how did you gain their trust to be able to conduct this work? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like any kind of research, it's a, it's a process, it wasn't a once off. I should note that when I, I first came across this network, I was in Berlin where I was based at the time and they were meeting and I went and met the founder Ben Brenzel of the network. And was just walking along the street and chatting to him and said, I'm really fascinated. Like, as a political scientist, how on earth are all these very similar organizations in such different countries from Israel to Poland to New Zealand? Like, it just is intrinsically interesting. Um, and that started a conversation. And I spent several months chatting, getting to know people. And every time I went to a conference, I was very explicit. And I introduced myself, said I was a researcher. You know, I was always honest about what I was doing and that I wanted to write a book. And always gave people the opportunity not to talk with me, which I think is important. And to ask me not to be in the room if they wanted to have a particular conversation. And I did a lot of process of checking consent for the material that I used. Um, in order to, to ensure that people could feel that they had control and trust in the process. Um, and in saying that, I think, uh, like anyone, if one of the, the benefits of this kind of work that I noticed, I think it's an interesting thing for academics to reflect on, is that it can be really useful to have somebody to do that institutional memory for an organization. Because campaigners that are rapid response are too busy campaigning to write down the stories. So it was also something Indirectly, it wasn't the primary aim of the book, but it ended up also being a useful resource to reflect all the organizations on their own strengths and weaknesses and the journeys they've been on. That's so fascinating. Um, one thing that you talked about in your presentation was um, how these organizations tend to be very um, defined by member-driven campaigns. The, the members choose what's important to them and their action pushes where they go. Um, but that you've seen them kind of pivot to longer term, more sustainable campaigns where staff is selecting a minority issue, for instance, and, and driving their membership towards that campaign. Um, I, I, that, that was my, that's always been my main thought. And I think that's one of the things people think about when they talk about slacktivism, clicktivism, is they're concerned that we're just distracted by the shiny object or the outrage machine. 
Um, do you see long-term uh, these advocacy organizations transitioning more and more and more into looking more like they've ex existing NGOs where they're building the long-term things? Or do you think the member-driven quality is too essential to who they are to lose that? Great question. Um, so I'll say two points. First of all, not all of the organizations have evolved towards the more staff-driven model. And they're not all doing it in all of their campaigns. So even GetUp is still running member-driven campaigns. Action Station still has, all of these organizations actually have websites where anyone can set up their own campaign, like an online petition portal, and you or I could just go on and set up. So that still exists even in the organizations that are staff-driven. Then you've also got a set of organizations, I'd say Quiftet in Sweden, which is a digital advocacy organization in Sweden, continues to be quite member-driven in a lot of its work, or at least at the end of uh, when I conducted research was still pursuing that model. 38 degrees only has probably recently shifted, but after I finished the book. So there is variation in how much the, the groups have changed or shifted their models. But the more fundamental question is, what does this mean for kind of the NGO advocacy sector as a whole? What is their role? And I think there's a bit of both worlds learning from each other. So the NGO world has looked to these groups, groups like Oxfam have said, wow, they're really rapid response, they're really fast. Maybe we should emulate some of these practices. So Greenpeace, for instance, has now got online petitions where you can go and sign up and set up your own petition. They created an initiative called Mob Lab, which was all about digitally distributed campaigning, which very much aligns with what these groups did. Um, and as you said, some of these groups are now trying to run more sustained campaigns. And where it gets most interesting is when they try and collaborate. And that's something that I tease out a bit in the book, but I think is worthy of further looking at, that you have an issue expert group, say Greenpeace on Climate or Transparency International Corruption, partnering with one of these big digital advocacy organizations which have millions of members and members that don't just care about this one issue, care about a bunch of other issues that could be mobilized to campaign, say, on corruption. And I think that's where these partnerships, not seeing them as single entities, is I think so, so really rich ground for further research. We've got a question uh, coming in from uh, a research fellow with TELUS, Paul Murphy. It says, could you discuss the concept of radical digital democracy, which bypasses the bureaucracy involved in policy formation by directly influencing decision makers? Um, and he notes the Belgian Pirate Party as an example of one of these. Yeah, so I think that question, and thanks, uh, Talis, for it, about radical direct democracy um, was probably at the start influencing a lot of these organizations that, in fact, move on at one point, stop doing even, I think, national campaigns because they just wanted to hand over all power to their members. And so one version, if you like, of radical direct democracy is just to say, whoever signs up to my email list becomes a member and they can influence where that campaign goes. And that would be a version of what I'm describing as like the pure member driven logic. But what's interesting with that is that these groups importantly have a set of values, progressive values that's guiding their campaigns. And when you're purely member driven, but you also, and you're trying to attract progressive members is sometimes a tension in how people define what they think progressive is. And a really clear example of this that, that might see how kind of these theoretical debates become relevant is Brexit. So a radical direct democracy would just say, well, one person, one vote on Brexit and the Labour Party should, you know, the British Labour Party just go according to what its members say. And that's exactly what happened with 38 Degrees. 38 Degrees surveyed its members on whether they should stay in the EU or leave. And they were split. The membership didn't have a, a clear majority. And so the organization, as a result, campaigned to be neutral in that space. We'll, they said, we won't take a side for or against, even though all their staff were very strongly supportive of staying in the EU. Now, I raise that because I think many of the have been critical of 38 Degrees' decision. Many other organizations have said, why did you try and transform those members' preferences who were like so anti the EU and actually try and educate and shift them 
And this is, I guess, part of the point of democracy is, is, is what is the role of interest groups? What is the role of these organizations? Are they just merely reflecting preferences or do they have a role in shaping? And they increasingly would argue they have a role in shaping and transforming. Can they do that? Open question. In some campaigns, yes, and others not. We've got another question and I'm kind of returning to a, a more foundational um, question here. Are all digital advocacy organizations NGOs? Yeah, it's a definitional question, really. Um, so they're all not-for-profits. They're in different countries. You have different regulation. And I would recommend Elizabeth Bloodgood's work on NGO laws and regulations. Interestingly, Move On is both a 501c3 and a 501c4. What that means for those who aren't familiar with those categories is that Move On is a non-governmental organization. It's not a political party but it has a legal status that means it can both be a uh, charity and receive donations that are tax free. So if somebody gives $10, you don't have to be taxed on that. You can even get some tax benefits. It also has another entity that's a political action committee, a PAC, which doesn't get those tax benefits, but because it's not a charity can engage in more partisan politics. So in answering your question, there's a whole myriad of legal forms, Action Station chose not to be a charity, but to be a limited liability company in New Zealand because it didn't want to be constrained by charity law. There's different ways they've constituted themselves based on strategic decisions of the activists who set it up and particular laws. But the answer to your question is yes, they will broadly conceive of themselves as not-for-profit and non-governmental and not political parties. Thanks for the questions, uh, keep them coming. Um, I wanted to um, come back to what you were talking about, how both the digital advocacy organizations are, are learning a little bit from the traditional organizations uh, in on sustainable campaigns, but that the traditional ones are learning too. They're bringing lessons home from these new organizations. Are we seeing government learning how to leverage digital communications and advocacy at all. I'm, I'm thinking when I ask this question, I've got my American hat on thinking about the lessons we saw the Obama campaign pioneer and th that were picked up in subsequent elections. Um, are we seeing governments advocate for their own policy decisions or priorities the same way that these organizations are advocating? Yeah, so one of the interesting points here is, at least in the US, there has been some personnel exchange, if you like, between people who've been involved in the Democratic, if you like, presidential campaigning elections, the Howard, the Dean campaign, Obama, and sometimes in the interregnum years after the campaign, then go and work or affiliated with these organizations. So Ben Branzell, who founded this network, was very involved in, um, in some of the democratic races. And they also have close relationships, many of these organizations with people in the, at least in the US, the democratic side of politics. So why that's important is because the learning may not just happen from watching, but it also happens because there can be interlinkages um, between individuals who are working. Not in all countries will it necessarily be that close. I think the US is quite particular because there is obviously so much money and so much energy and time and a huge professional um, just area. There's so many people working in, in campaigning. Um, that there is probably more scope for those kinds of exchanges to happen. Um, there are other work that's been done if people are interested more broadly on digital diplomacy, on the ways that governments have been opening up. That's sort of a bit beyond the scope of my work. But there's also really interesting work on digital political parties. Um, Paolo Garbaldo has written a book, and I sort of mentioned some of this work in my intro about how we can think of how digital technologies have enabled new forms of social movements, new forms of political parties, like we heard the Pirate Party, Five Star Movement, um, as well as new forms of NGOs. So I think, I think the questions I ask in this book, I obviously scope down to a more narrow set of organizations, but you could cast them also across to political parties and how they've changed over time with digital technology. One um, big question I have, um, is with the rise of transnational advocacy, 
are we seeing the emergence of a group of people for whom issues or ideology supersede nationality in terms of identity or or loyalties? Um, are there people who define themselves more by their advocacy than by any other marker? Mm. So in my work, the organization, the members of the organization I study don't necessarily strongly identify with the organization. And I think this comes back to a key part of how the organizations work. So you might be mobilized by Get Up to protest for refugee rights or mobilized by Move On to protest against the Iraq war. But you may not say, I'm here as a Move On supporter. You may just say, I'm here because I don't agree with the Iraq war or I want to see refugee rights. And Dana Fisher, based at the University of Maryland, has done some interesting work on this, looking at the resistance to Trump, where she went out and surveyed um, people who were at all the major marches in Washington, D.C., March for Our Lives, uh, March for Science. And she actually found in her work that Move On was really important in the background, mobilizing people. But people didn't necessarily identify that in the surveys she did. So why am I saying that? Because in answering your question, I don't, in my work, see them people being mobilized around organizational identities. They may have attachments to particular issues, but often they're quite broad, but they are concerned about, I'd say, progressive politics in their country. That's kind of a key mobilizer. But they're not also, the members of Get Up in Australia aren't connected directly or see themselves as part of an international network. While the organizations, the staff who are professionals, who are paid, go to these summits, the members are sitting in their own countries. Um, and this is an interesting conversation that I've had with the network about whether and if sometimes they've done global calls where they bring in all of their members on particular issues, but most of the time um, they're very much focused in, in, in national contexts. Yeah, thanks for unpacking that a little bit more. Um, and uh, I think we're, we're coming up to the end of our time here, so I just want to give you an opportunity um, to leave us with maybe a, a closing thought about um, what's what's one of the biggest takeaways that we should go home with uh, on this topic? Well, first of all, thanks so much for hosting me. Um, it's been a real pleasure to talk with you all. And I found one of the things that struck me most was the strength and importance of face-to-face -face connections, even in a community of digital activists. And I talk about this quite a lot in the book because um, they ran yearly summits where people came together from this network open that were really the glue that bound it together. And I think often in the digital world, we do talk about the benefits, the strengths, the weaknesses, but there is so much strength. I say this as we're meeting on Zoom and meeting in person that's hard to replicate. And obviously after COVID, many of us appreciate this, but I think it's important to remember in the context of talking about the role of digital technology, the role of social media, that it, it can enable a lot and it can complement the face-to-face. -face. And I, I don't see them as competing in the way some people do, but I think it's it really astounded me how critical it was for this network to have that face-to-face. -face. Thank you so much, Nina. This has been so enlightening and uh, wonderful to be able to hear more of all this that's inside of your book. Um, I do encourage everyone to um, take a look at her book, Transnational Advocacy in the Digital Era, Think Global, Act Local. There it is. Uh, we really appreciate your time and thank you to all of you who joined us. Um, and just a reminder, we will have the recording available online. So uh, check it out if you didn't get to catch all of it. Um, thanks so much and have a great afternoon. Thanks, goodbye.